Uh, and uh, we're up to 1,723 shows now. Uh, Run As Radio is a show I do on my own since uh, 2007. And it is um, uh, more aimed at the IT Pro. And so we're 760 shows into that. And the tablet show, we only ran for about three years. Back at the time, we weren't sure if .NET really raw. It was a scary time. Anyway, those times are past. And we want to talk more about open source. And this is an interesting question in general, just because when did open source come to Microsoft? And what does that even mean? Like Microsoft had open source code in its world for a really long time. But today, when we look at Microsoft, open source is a huge part of the way that it does business. And for some folks that really uh, anchors around the build conference in 2014, that was when Satya Nadella was now CEO and they did a whole bunch of crazy announcements around open source that for some folks it's like, okay, well now Microsoft is really serious about open source. But if you really wanna understand it, you have to go further back than that. Uh, like all the way back, let's go back to 1975 when this is Microsoft's logo. That's right, Microsoft had a disco period. Now, this is the kind of Microsoft we're talking about where, where Bill Gates still looks like a 12 year old because I think he's maybe 19 in this picture. And that's uh, the now departed Paul Allen. And this is the kinds of computers they were working with in the early 70s. And, and Bill, even then was a key visionary. The, the era of the microcomputer was just beginning, and there were lots of new machines being made all the time, and they all needed their own software. And there was really no relationship between the different software and the different machines. In fact, you tend to get a new machine, you wrote all new software for it, which was fine if you're a hobbyist. But Bill really wanted to make a business out of that. And he had the insight to recognize that you really want to uncouple the software from the device itself so that you could have software that would move from device to device but at that time in that hobbyist era nobody was paying for software software was given away i mean either you had a big machine that you got from ibm and it came with two guys with lab coats and they wrote software for you or you had a little machine and you wrote all your own and they largely got together in the early prototypes of what would be considered user groups and shared that software around and that essentially meant no business for Microsoft. He wanted to sell software. And when he released the software, the hobbyists would share it with each other. And he wrote this letter way back in the 1970s, which is sort of a, an open letter to hobbyists saying, listen, we're at the beginning of an industry here that's going to change the world, but only if we can build the software and make it into a business that will help us to actually grow and to evolve. And in the end, that came true. I mean, if you think about where we are today, this business of software has continued to exist. And I think many people watching this now, I mean, this is how we made it living. This is how I bought my home, was writing software for people. Now, in order to sell the software, there was some legal concerns around that. And so the byproduct of actually selling the software was the EULA, the End User License Agreement, which if you ever decide to actually read this agreement in detail, you'll discover it's a snoozer. Like if you need to fall asleep, reading a EULA is a good way to go. But if you dig further into it, you, re you start to see things like you don't actually own your software. You've only purchased a license to use that software. And part of that license includes an indemnification. It says, listen, if this software costs you money, the limit of our liability is the price you paid for the software. So you may buy Excel and make a spreadsheet with it to model the structure of a bridge. But if that bridge falls down because the Excel equation didn't work correctly, the most we're going to give you back is what you pay for itself. Now, that's a kind of crazy limitation when you think about it from a consumer goods point of view. But when you think about it from the perspective of creating software, it allowed the software industry to grow very rapidly, to build things quickly, because 
they didn't have the concerns of liability that would have forced us to write software much more slowly and carefully, as had been done in earlier times and still done in some parts of the world. You know, you kind of want to make sure that the software that flies an airplane works pretty well. And those software standards are much, much higher. But when you talk about the early business commercial software that was out there, it had some quality problems. Maybe it has more today now that replacing it is simply a download. But the EULA may be the thing that people ultimately remember Bill Gates for. You know, he drove the concept of the EULA. And his business model of selling software meant that they needed to protect that software. And so a huge part of writing software in any tech giant are these patents. If you're a software developer for Microsoft, one of the things you do is file patents on the code that you write. There are lawyers to help you. And you often get bonuses based on the patents that you get. You might, uh, uh, you'll get these little cubes and, uh, and there's different rewards that might be part of your overall compensation scheme. But this process of open software versus closed software, it's not as simple as you might think. You can't just make it open. You've gone to great lengths or your organization has gone to great, great lengths to protect that, that closed source software, to protect its value with patents and other legal constructs. And so changing your mind on that is not a trivial thing. Now, it turns out for in, in a lot of ways we have. And one of the reasons that that happened is that over time, all of these big tech companies built up bodies of patents, tens and hundreds of thousands of them. They called them IP moats. And they waged war on them because often there was a game you could play where you know, if I didn't like something you're working on, I thought it infringed on my patents, I could sue you over those patents. But you probably also have patents that maybe I would be infringing on. And so it sort of turned into this mutually assured destruction. Uh, here's a, an actual court document of the interactions of patent arsenals during a, a, a court complaint around Android. So just to get a sense of how many different companies all were holding patents. And the byproduct of this entire process, ultimately, is it just became this sort of mutually assured destruction. If you sue me over patents, I'll sue you over patents, and the only people who are going to make money are lawyers. And so today, you see sort of cross-licensing agreements between all of these big corporations, which is essentially says, you know, if there's anything that might be infringing, it's okay, we have a blanket license to you for that and vice versa, which sounds really good on the surface, although I'd also say that also builds a barrier for anybody new coming into the field, that the big companies have largely sort of sewn up this mayhem around that. But I wanted to clarify this idea that is not the, the difference between closed source and open source is not just the word. It is legal constructs and it is uh, complex, and it was the way that software was made for decades uh, until the open source movement really came along. And, and continuing on that history narrative, we do have to talk about how things changed or began to change at Microsoft. And I, uh, in my history of .NET talks, I've used this, this Getty picture before because it's such a happy picture. This is a picture from July of 1998 of Steve and Bill, and this is at a time when when they're kind of on top of the world. This is, you know, Windows ME is doing its things. And, uh, you know, this, there's pretty much nothing but goodness going on. In fact, in 1995, there was this Time Magazine cover where Bill's on the cover and uh, talking about, and they're talking of calling him the Lydia, the master of the universe. Because Bill's original mission, this idea of a personal computer on everyone's desk, he had, by 1995, he'd largely made that come true with Windows 95 and the move to 16 uh, to 32-bit. Like, it was big and hugely powerful. And the funny part is that in typical American fashion, you build these heroes up and then you tear them back down. Although Bill did himself no favors. And if you uh, get a chance to go on YouTube, have a look at the... At Bill Gates's uh, deposition to the Senate in 1998. Um, I'm pretty sure that folks like 
the Zuckerberg today, as they're going to the Senate, are shown these videos as a cautionary tale. Don't do this. Being essentially derisive and insulting to, to senators is just an unwise thing to do. And we know historically what happened that by in 1998, as it does this deposition, by 1999, Microsoft has declared a pernicious monopoly and uh, is ordered to break up. We split into two companies, an operating systems company and everything else's company. And so that by January of 2000, and this is a picture from that day where Bill announces stepping down as the CEO and Steve Ballmer's taking over. Uh, quite a contrast from the picture just a couple of years before. Now, I would point out that this process of moving Steve over into CEO had already been underway for some time, but there's every evidence that the, the DOJ case accelerated that. And so Bill steps down as CEO in, in January of 2000, becomes chief architect, still in the company, Bomber takes over as CEO. And really his first job, first and foremost, is to stop the company from being broken up, which he succeeds in doing, but it takes him almost two years. He'll get the consent decree by November of 2001. And so in that, and in that time span is also where he'll say, Linux is a cancer, although he was really referring to the GPL at the time. But again, we have the benefit of hindsight 20 years on as to what's actually happened to all of these things. Now, in that time period was also when .NET first emerged and uh, it was announced at the PDC in 2000. So, Steve is now the CEO, Bill is the chief architect, and they do this kind of reveal, kind of surprise folks with .NET, which they, they very much focused on it being uh, a new platform based on internet standards. So, and remember, Bill, that Steve's literally in the midst of the conversation now with the Department of Justice about not breaking up the organization uh, and uh, getting the consent decree. And so they're doing these things to, to present themselves as a more open company going forward. They did publish in 2000 the C sharp specifications and the common language infrastructure specifications as ECMA specifications. So, and again, it was a very much a symbol of it's not really open source, but it is the specifications. And those specifications are important ultimately. Uh, when a young man at the age of 29 named Miguel Diacaza uh, in July of 2001, having reviewed those specifications that had only been published a few months before or, and and turns that into the mono project mono being the spanish word for monkey and uh, what he'd really done was uh building a clean room version of .NET. so he's taking the specifications he's looking none of the .NET code and he's writing a version for linux and he will be i don't know i'd have to say treated very poorly that whole time the microsoft people are suspicious of him because he's a linux person and the Linux people are not sure what to think of him because he's working on Microsoft technology. That's weird. So not easy to be Miguel, but those are early days. And we'll, we'll hear from Miguel again as the open source story evolves. Also part of the original release of .NET was the shared source common language infrastructure. The code name was Rotor. His SSCLI sucks as a name, but hey, Microsoft has a long history of making terrible names for products. Now, what was this? Well, this was .NET with all the Windows stuff stripped up. So you had the runtime, base cost libraries, C Sharp, uh, the compiler. Was it open source? No, not really. It was what they called an academic research license. So if you had academic credentials, you could request access to the source code of .NET minus all the Windows stuff. And by access, I mean, you get to read it. It doesn't compile, you no know way to modify it, but you can look at it, enjoy. Now, if you weren't involved in academia or you were just working at, you know, doing your job writing software, that didn't impact you all that much. But fast forward a couple of years and, uh, you know, the first versions of, of .NET are a little bit rough, but they started to get their feet under them by version two which really is the third version, these numbers are hard. And uh, I would call it sort of the ascendancy of, of ASP.NET, especially web forms by 2005. You know, Microsoft 
knew they were taking a bunch of existing developers, WinForms developers, largely from Visual Basic, but other sources as well, and you teach them web way at the early days. And so they created a model in web forms that allowed you to do web development without really understanding web development. And it was fine for its purpose at the time, but by 2005, it's kind of mature. And the web has got a lot more traction on it now. We're coming out of the hangover that was the dot-com bust after the dot-com boom. So we sort of, from the beginning of Netscape in 97, 98, through that crazy time until around 2000, when the whales kind of fell off. And now when you're getting 2005, 2006, we're getting to what they called Web 2.0. And there's a real surge in web development for the most part, but that's not ASP.NET. ASP.NET's its own funny little world, actually. No, the fun and excitement by 2006 was Ruby on Rails. Now, everybody's web friend, David Heinemeyer Hansen, DHH, the guy behind Basecamp to this day, and one of the great thinkers in web development, make no mistake. He had taken an old language, a language called Ruby from the 90s, and he had added this scaffold to it he called Rails. And this first versions came along actually in 2004, but by 2006, it was the business. People really enjoyed the dynamic approach of Ruby made it really fun to code in. Rails was able to read data structures and generate the pages quickly. So it was easy to iterate, to build uh, websites fast and uh, a fun place to work. And folks like Scott Guthrie saw the writing on the wall that this emerging web culture was going to be incredibly important. And there had to be a way for them to to make products in that space as well. But they had to understand that audience better. And they actually made a conference around this going back to 2006 called Mix. Uh, and this is, I would point out we're in 1080p today, and this is a lovely graphic that was made in 2006 at about 320 by 200. I have a very nice version because I actually paid someone to remake the graphic at higher resolution. This is what the original logo looked like. It was in Las Vegas. Uh, the Mix Conference was a ton of fun. Uh, it was all about this sort of next web. And it was a collection of efforts by Microsoft as a whole to, to try and be a part of web culture. And one of the things that they had announced at Mix was CodePlex, that they were going to make their own source forge for open source. So this is before GitHub. It'll be a couple of years before GitHub will come along. Source forge existed. But uh, Coplex was where Microsoft was going to go. And their first uh, things that landed in Coplex were, were pretty cool. Things like uh, ASP.NET Ajax, which has an interesting history. You know, it, it goes all the way back to Outlook Web Access. So when the IE team was making IE, even back in the 5.0 days, the Exchange team came to them, really, the, and the, with the Outlook guys, and said, listen, we're, we're going to make a web client for the Exchange Mail server, and uh, we'd really like to be able to tell you when mail arrives. So we've got this idea for an extension of the browser, this uh, XML HTTP extension, so that we can send globs of data down asynchronously to the page. Like, would you add it to the browser? And the IE team said, sure, why not? And accidentally kind of invented a technology which a bunch of other people ran with. And one of the manifestations of this by 2006 was the ASP.NET Ajax control toolkit that allowed you essentially to take a div and tag it to an Ajax call so that you could repopulate pieces of your page. I wouldn't call it a spa, but it was the beginnings of those ideas. Uh, but later in that evolution was uh, .NET MVC. So MVC was the kind of response that Microsoft had to the complaints around web form. That could we build something a little bit more testable, a bit more reliable, uh, a little easier to develop against long-term. So they announced MVC at Mix. They also talked about, and this is you know, in that Vista timeframe, the Windows Presentation Foundation everywhere. So, Jumping back a little bit, going back to like the PDC in 03, when they first talked about what the next version of Windows was gonna look like, 
they talked about the three pillars with great code names, Avalon, and Indigo, and Arrow, and WinFS. But then as Vista appeared and those things were peeled away, they reformed under .NET 3 with less desirable names, names like Windows Presentation Foundation and Windows Communications Foundation and, and so on. And so there was this idea with WPF, formerly codenamed Avalon, that it would run on more platforms, that it had more possibilities. And uh, being the, one of the .NET Rocks guys, we got a chance to interview Brad Abin right at the very beginning. And I asked him this question, it's like, WPFE, because the title wasn't already long enough. He goes, don't worry, that's a code name. Because if you have a bad code name, you get a good product. And that's where Silverlight ultimately came from, was this WPFE. And it was announced at Mix, but it didn't uh, come to fruition until till sometime later. So uh, the first uh, bits of it really show up in 2008 uh, as a JavaScript scripted language. We wouldn't get C Sharp in it until version two. And uh, at the same time, they also support the Mono project who makes a version of Silverlight for Mono called Moonlight. Now, I would be remiss talking about open source at Microsoft, which so far I haven't talked an awful lot about open source. I mean, they really are getting a feel for it. They're talking mix. They've set up code collections, a couple of projects over there. They're building the code largely in the background internally still. Their build systems are all internal, but they're pushing versions of that code out to CodePlex where you can comment on it. And they are reading it. They are taking the feedback. Uh, but there was another group of folks that were more passionate about open source in the Microsoft community. Uh, I first encountered them uh, at an MVP summit where I was looking to, to meet with the team that was making Entity Framework. And Entity Framework was an ORM that Microsoft was building and I thought it would make a good show in Dot and the Rocks. This is right at the very, very beginning, nothing had been announced yet. And so they were showing it to the MVPs and I thought it was a good time to meet with some of the PMs and talk about what shows to make giant time the .NET Rocks to be released when a new framework was released. And when I arrived at the room, it was a bit, shall we say, raucous. Uh, the folks were very animated, very, uh, uh, they were pro and hibernate. An ORM in the open source community that already worked well in .NET needed some things. And basically their position was like, stop making new things, support the things that already exist, we can make this better. Now I may have said on the show, uh, that they were the Inhibernate Mafia. And so their folks decided that was not a good name, so they came up with a new name shortly thereafter known as Alt.net. Now, Alt.net was around for a few years, and its basic mission, its concept was that the .NET developers should use more open source, and that Microsoft should be part of that, should support open source projects rather than just build their own things. And this is a time when the culture around Microsoft very much was, if it's not made at Microsoft, I'm not interested. Most developers just use the stuff that Microsoft gave them. And so the Alt.net folks were trying to push them into looking at the broader community. Uh, and one could argue whether their methods and, and their approaches work particularly well. But, you know, funny, I had Jeremy Miller on Donna Rock not that long ago, and I, we brought up the whole story of Alt.net, which he was an early participant, and I said, I think you guys kind of won. In the end, like your mission of getting them to use more open source, that, that came true. Because, you know, look where we are today. It largely did happen. Now, Alt.net also made a conference uh, back in the uh, in 2008. They had their first sort of unconference, and they invited Scott Guthrie to be a keynoter there. And on the way to that keynote in Austin, uh, Guthrie decided to show off the early bits of MVC. Uh, and show it as a demo. And he hired a group of pro open source people. Uh, in fact, uh, we all we called them the the Scott Guthrie's Ninja Army. And uh, there's this picture. This is actually from the cover of the uh, first version of the MVC book of a bunch of them. Well, Guthrie's there along with Phil Hack and Scott uh, Hanselman and Rob Connery, all looking terribly young today because it was more than 10 years ago. But uh, it came true. They, the MVC was largely built on 
CodePlex actually was built internally and then was deployed out to CodePlex and they took a lot of feedback from the uh, users. So kind of open source. The source was there, but you couldn't really contribute to it. It's not what we consider open source today, but it was further down the path. And also in 2008 with .NET Framework 3.5, that old, the old Rotor project, the shared source initiative evolved. It became what they called the Microsoft Reference Library. Uh, and the difference now was if you, anybody could now get this license, you just needed to be a developer. And what it actually allowed you to do was to debug with the .NET framework. So you could now have breakpoints inside of the .NET framework if you wanted to. So it really, allowed you to see more deeply into how the .NET code actually ran. You couldn't modify it, you couldn't compile it, but you could at least debug with it. So it was it was progress, without a doubt. Uh, also in that same time frame, G GitHub does start. It was good fun finding this original logo before Octocad or any of these things, the GitHub social coding, this was their vision, was there are other source forges, but a place that you could really talk about things, that was new. So GitHub's at its very beginnings in 2008. Uh, related to the MBC conversation, as MBC started to evolve and it didn't have that, the same kinds of mechanisms that we think of today in HTML5, they, you know, when HTML was not that great and JavaScript was struggling, really we needed helpers to do DOM tree uh, walking and so forth. And there, there were great helpers already out there, uh, namely jQuery. So, John Rezig actually developed this way back in 2006. And in the MBC world, they were beginning to realize that tree traversal was a huge problem and started to build their own version. And when they showed the original initial prototypes on CodePlex, the community pushed back and said, why are you right reinventing the wheel here? We use jQuery, you should too. And they listened. They listened so hard that by 2010, when they shipped Studio 2010, jQuery was in the box. And that, to me, was an interesting line that they crossed at that point. For the first time, arguably ever, Microsoft took an open source project with permission, included it in one of their commercial project products for sale, provided tech support for it, and actually contributed to that project to support it. In fact, contributed enough that it evolved substantially to eventually become the jQuery Foundation and ultimately the JavaScript Foundation. So 2010 was a big year for Microsoft in so many ways. I mean, they, that version of Studio was big. It's the one that implemented WPF. It was MVC2. It was also C Sharp 4. It was also the first version of F Sharp, um, which would ultimately become quite open source as well. By this point, Silverlight is actually version four, now running out of the browser, working with Chrome, that's when the 2010 Olympics were in Vancouver, my town, and uh, NBC had all their tooling built in Silverlight. But to me, looking at the open source world, it was jQuery being the box. And that sort of pivotal moment that included jQuery. Uh, along the way, uh, within the year, Phil Hack will get the project known, that was known as NuGet. Uh, and he was basically told, we need a package manager like Ruby Gems, go make one for .NET. Uh, the actual story is more complex than that. And if you've been a listener to Dr. Rocks, you're probably aware that there were other people trying to make packet managers at the time. And, uh, you know, that all ended up rolling into NuGet or ultimately going away. Um, NuGet's still out there today, but managing open source projects is hard and uh, open source libraries, and that's what this tooling is about. Another key moment in my mind is when Damian Edwards and David Fowler started Signal R. Now, what made Signal R cool was they were already employees at Microsoft. And part of the sort of traditional community of software development at these big companies was, listen, if you write software, you're writing it for us, right? We pay you, we own that software. And, and they were, after hours work was kind of discouraged, but with the open source community emerging, those restrictions went away. And, and Damien and David point blank went to their manager and said, hey, we have an idea for doing sort of real-time coding uh, library. Uh, it doesn't really fit into what we're doing right now in ASP.NET, 
but we're going to do it on in open source on GitHub on the you know very young GitHub. And there were sure go ahead do what you want to do. So I see it as an important point in open source at Microsoft because these were Microsoft employees working on an on an open source project independently of their jobs. And uh, and but although interestingly, ultimately SignalR did get introduced into ASP.NET and is now part of the package, although it remains an open source project all along. Uh, and I've got to talk a little bit about Rosalind. Now, Rosalind didn't start out as an open source cross-platform project. The original incarnations of Rosalind, well, the idea of writing a compiler in your language is one of those sort of fundamental things of software development. When you create a language, you know your language is kind of mature when you can make a compiler for your language in your language. Now, up until now, C Sharp had been written in C++, which is really interesting because you realize that meant most of the people that built C Sharp through those days never wrote code in C Sharp. I mean, the QA team did because they actually tested C Sharp. But those folks making C Sharp, they were C++ programmers. And there had been an several initiatives to try and write C-sharp in C-sharp early on. They just hadn't come to fruition. But it wasn't until 2011 that it sort of hit ahead, it hit this point where it really couldn't go any further along. They were now writing two versions of C-sharp, the compiler version and the version that ran in telecode that allowed you to have your code dynamically parsed by Visual Studio. And it was expensive to write it twice like that. And so they, the proposal then was this compiler to service that would fill both roles and that would be more efficient and it would also be written in C-sharp. Uh, it was developed completely internally, although eventually they started publishing versions of it to CodePlex, very much the same way that MVC was done. And it wasn't really planned as an open source project, but it kind of evolved that way. And I would also point out that largely those initiatives were driven by Mads Torgensen, who at that time was now taking over the leadership of C-Sharp. Anders Hausberg was moving on to another project, which we'll talk about a little later. Also in 2011, our friend Miguel Diacaza resurfaced. A little bit older, a little bit wiser, and uh, with Novel running out of steam and Attachmate buying it, it actually spins off all of the cool stuff he's working on, especially things like the... Uh, making C Sharp actually run on the iPhone, and now and by 2011 running on Android, creates a new company with his friend, Nat Friedman called Xamarin. And to me, this is super interesting because this was a time when it, things were pretty dark for .NET. Microsoft was heavily immersed in trying to make Windows 8, and there was a big push on JavaScript at that time. And this is at, and the iPads already come out, that was actually in 2010, and that's when Steve Jobs had his thoughts on Flash, where he basically said Safari's not going to allow plugins to run anymore. And that would take out Flash, but it also took out Silverlight. And so Silverlight wasn't going to run on every platform. And so you know, Microsoft started really focusing on JavaScript in a lot of ways. And I remember saying on .NET Rocks at this time that it seemed like with Anders moving on, Miguel was kind of the keeper of C Sharp in some respects, because he was making C Sharp run on all the other stacks the places where it would run. But we do know what Anders was doing. Anders was doing TypeScript. And TypeScript ultimately became important in the open source community uh, for Microsoft as well. I mean, Anders was doing what Anders always done, which is helping developers be more productive. And he's remarkably good at that. And he saw a need for there to be static typing available JavaScript in a way to just make JavaScript more reliable, to make it more sustainable projects. We know today, obviously, that was going to work. But it was a very challenging thing to do at the beginning. And of course, they started TypeScript from scratch on CodePlex. And the open source community took to it almost immediately. In fact, they didn't directly contribute to TypeScript, but TypeScript needed all of these type libraries, all of these ability uh, to understand the type rules for different libraries. And the open source community stepped up and built huge amounts of them. In fact, one of the most profound ones, I think the one that shook them the most was in when it was when Palantir Technologies, which is a Silicon Valley company, is about as anti-Microsoft as you could possibly imagine, and Java through and through produced a plug, developed a plugin for the Eclipse development environment to code in TypeScript. 
culturally inside of Microsoft, there was sort of this belief that we're never going to make it an open source. They see us as the enemy. There's really no point. And I'm not saying that Andrews Heilsberg definitely thought that way, but he wasn't sure that the open source community necessarily embrace it. And he, he certainly was no Scott Hanselman in the sense that he didn't have great open source chops. And yet here he was leading a project that the open source community openly embraced. And so it sort of kind of fed back to Microsoft to say, hey, when you do good things in the open source community, the open source community responds. It is possible. You can do this and became a mile marker in Microsoft's evolution towards open source to be able to see that, yes, when we do the right thing, we can be successful. And it still wasn't really the open source that we think of as today, right? That that you still couldn't really contribute to that. You can now, but at that point, they were still doing the Codeplex thing where they were still building it internally and then pushing it on the Codeplex. Around that same time, Microsoft started a new group called the Open Technologies Group. And this is in 2012, Jean Pauli leading it. And nominally to the outside world, what they were really what they were talking about was making sure that important open source libraries, things like Elasticsearch, Redis, uh, Memcached, had great .NET providers, could work well in .NET. They really were starting to make contributions to more open source projects in general to make sure their stacks ran better internally this is also the place where this is a wholly owned subsidiary for microsoft and this is the place where people who wanted to develop things in open source that were microsoft things we could call it <clears throat> now it would only last a few years by 2015 we could scroll into the company after the whole company or at least dev did became very open source centric but this is the place where entity framework went when they wanted to open source so the entity framework you know, I've talked about it before, and it's impacted it to help create all .NET and so forth. But interestingly, early on, they recognized it's like, hey, you know, this is moved towards open source, and it's where other ORMs live. We should be open source, too. And yet they shipped several versions at this point as closed source products with all those patents, all those rules around it. And so living under open tech for a while, they sought to unwind those things. It's like, if we were going to open source this existing code, what would we have to do? And they spent six months doing it, working closely with legal. They would go through all of the patents that have been filed, and they would either discard the patent, recognize it's no value, or you know, deconflict them all. And it took months and months of work, completely internally, just because legal thought it would be necessary, until they finally got to the bottom of the stack where they just ran out of complaints, and then they open sourced. Now, we may have seen this on the outside. It was very interesting that, hey, look, Entity Framework is now going to be an open source product. We didn't understand what had happened in the back end. And we didn't really understand the impact, again, that it had to Microsoft. Because folks that were looking at open source instead of Microsoft largely looked at it as, this is something we do greenfield. When we make a new thing, we can choose to make it open source. Look at what they did with TypeScript. But for our existing stuff, there's no way out. And then Entity Framework pulled it off. And so then suddenly there was this push. It's like, you mean we can? rehabilitate existing software <laughs> and they went to the entity framework it's like how did you do it and looked at what they did went well this is crazy and that created a push to sort of make it easier to do all of this fast forward a little bit more and really the turning of the page of microsoft was when it when it satchin adela comes on board um microsoft was already pivoting towards the cloud that was inevitable but when Azure was first announced in 2008, it was announced as Windows Azure. When Satya becomes CEO in 2014, that's February, the next month they rename Windows Azure Microsoft Azure. And then the month after that is that great build conference. And, you know, in the Azure marketplace today, you can find several different flavors of Linux to download. So it kind of would be weird to call it the Windows Azure Marketplace when you got builds of Linux there. So, all right, it's not really a cancer, I guess, because it's in the store. But it does loop us back to the beginning of this story so far. Right? That a lot of folks look at that point when build in 2014 with Satch as the CEO, this was the moment. And it was an important moment, without a doubt, because this is also the conference where they said Windows is now free for machines with nine inch size screens and smaller. 
window free. And if you weren't any, had any question about it, is this a window centric company or an Azure centric company? Azure is not free in any way, but Windows can be free under certain conditions. We did have that great moment where Anders Halsberg came on stage and pushed the button to deploy Roslyn to GitHub and announce it as an open source cross-platform product. So it evolved into that. It's also got to announce version one of TypeScript. And they created the .NET Foundation in 2014. And one of the early participants was some of the Xamarin libraries and a bunch of other libraries of speakers at this show, by the way. So, you know, the foundation became this ability to put open source software in a place where it's legally protected, uh, its licensing is straightened out, its security, essentially, so that companies that are nervous about the role of open source software in their organization can have some confidence that there's a bigger organization going on. And so that build conference was very important. It wasn't the only thing because at this point, we're really only getting started because now we get to talk about .NET Core. So the build conference was in the spring of 2014. By the fall of 2014, they finished the assessment and they realized they can't open source the .NET framework as it stands. It's impossible. For starters, the .NET framework was built over top of Windows. It was deeply interlaced with Windows. And if you're going to do this, to actually create an open source cross-platform version, you have to break those associations with Windows. And that's an incredibly hard thing to do. It was actually easier to rewrite the code. And that's what they set out to do. They started in 2014. It'll take them 18 months to get to V1. But what's interesting is they do all of the development on GitHub. And they do all of it in an open way. There are no secrets in the .NET core group. You literally can see and participate in the conversations as they're developing. And they struggle. It takes time to learn how to develop in this new model. You know, they're used to their build systems being internal and their testing infrastructure internal, and that it's only the direct team that works on the code. The idea of doing this in public was hard for them to do and hard for them to learn. And they also take contributions, which is challenging, but they get there. And you know, as you well know, they put up multiple versions with MIT licenses. They come up with a new long-term support model where some versions are going to be supported for three years and other versions are only supported for an extra version or so to try and get people into the cadence of keeping on updating those different versions. So that starts in 2014 and is going on till this day. Um, Visual Studio Code, Code comes out and based on the Electron framework, it's a huge hit, largely more popular with non-Microsoft developers, non.NET developers than with .NET developers below. I'm a .NET developer through and through, and I think it's great. And ultimately by 2016, Xamarin is acquired by Microsoft and becomes part of the company. And that is important for a bunch of reasons. And not only that, they now have a iPhone and Android development stack on C. But these two fine fellows, Miguel and Nat, now join the company. Miguel is a distinguished engineer and continuing to work both on Xamarin and many other projects around .NET. But Nat will go on, uh, he'll initially join the TFS group as a vice president, and he'll ultimately go on to be the CEO of GitHub once it's acquired. Now, I want to talk a bit about Kubernetes. Uh, not that I'm super excited about the open sources of containers, but because also that there are more orchestration engines than just Kubernetes. And yet somehow Kubernetes is run to the top. And we like to believe as engineers that it's because the technology was so good. And I have nothing bad to say about Kubernetes really, but it's, I don't think it won because it was the best technology. You know, Kubernetes was an open, it was and is an open source project and the Google Cloud used it. And in those early days, so Google's, uh, fabric or solution, its orchestration engine for containers was Kubernetes. On the Microsoft side, they had service fabric. And on the Amazon side, there's Elastic Cloud. They were all different. They were all vendor specific. But only one of them was an open source project. And then this guy, Brendan Burns, joined Microsoft in 2016. And that was an interesting move. Of course, if he was going to be uh, part of Microsoft, then there was going to be a version of Kubernetes that ran on Azure. And that pretty much put Amazon in a place where it's like, if we don't make Kubernetes run on Amazon as well, we're missing out. 
So the three big cloud players now have a common container orchestration engine. And now a great ecosystem grew up around it as well. Hey, listen, Brandon, I know you're big, but I, I can have a big head too. Maybe you know, bigger, smaller, but very uh, The question is, is that suppressive of competition? You know, it's an interesting reality about that. You think about the guys that made DCSOS. Like there was, uh, there was some other great orchestration engines, but when these big three tech giants all start putting energy into one open source library, is that a monopoly? It's kind of open source. Does that actually make the industry better? We, we want multiple orchestration engines because that put Kubernetes over the top. But now an ecosystem grew around it. Now you can hire people with skills in it. And there's good training materials. Like there's a network effect that happens when enough people consolidate around a particular approach. So it may not have had the best technical merit and the most features, at least initially. Pretty good now, but that had more to do with sort of legal ownership model of anything else. Microsoft saw the writing on the wall and, and uh, in 2017 switched Coplex over to an archive only mode. All of the projects that were still busy and functioning with GitHub uh, and all, but all of the work that was done in Coplex is still there to this day. If you want to go back and read people's comments from 2009 around the Ajax toolkit, you can. Uh, but it was a recognition that GitHub was the place where software development was going to be done. Uh, and by that point, by 2017, Microsoft was the single largest contributor to open source projects on GitHub. Many of them their own, but many of them not their own. And in 2018, ultimately, they acquired GitHub. And this seemed unlikely. Uh, and it leaked just before it was announced. And there, you know, there were some people that were doing the, oh, Microsoft's destroying everything kind of freak out. And a lot of other people were saying, it's kind of the best outcome for GitHub. You know, GitHub always struggled to make money as a startup, and suddenly that's just not going to be an issue anymore. So you know, there were folks that said, Microsoft is protecting GitHub for all of us because they depend on it, and now we can depend on it too. Uh, that's an interesting role change compared to 2000, where they were the pernicious monopoly, and now they're being looked at as more a protector of a technology and certainly a technology they depend on and then moved a huge amount of work onto as well. So I think we've yet to see what GitHub will ultimately become. Nat Friedman becomes the CEO, GitHub run as a wholly owned subsidiary, much the same way when they acquired LinkedIn, they kept it as a wholly owned subsidiary rather than actually rolling it into Microsoft person. Um, not as well known, but I think also important uh, in that same time frame was when Microsoft took 60,000 of its own patents and move them, uh, license them under the Open Invention Network. Now that doesn't mean Microsoft got out of the patent business. In those 60,000 patents, not a one of them has anything to do with Windows or Azure. But they do have a lot to do with things like Linux because the OI, OIN protects Linux. And not only is Microsoft distributing various versions of Linux on the marketplace, but they have their own version as well. If you've not spent any time with Azure Sphere, Azure Sphere is, is a, uh, an IoT technology focused on security. And so it has security going through the hardware, firmware operating system all the way through. And it, Microsoft literally has their own build of Linux to make Azure Sphere. That's a heck of a change. You know, Linus Torvald said early on, like, we, uh, I'm not going to Windows, Windows come to me. That came true. That, uh, you know, Microsoft uses Linux as well. That's about 2018. In 2019, we get .NET Core 3. And this is interesting because this is the point where they start really catching up with the existing framework. And what they do is separate out the platform-specific SDK. So .NET Core 3 brought us win forms for .NET Core as a separate Windows SDK. So, uh, and gave us high DPI, although with potentially breaking changes, but that's fine. What we're looking at is a way forward that we can get more of those features that are still Windows dependent. We just run them away from the central set of .NET Core. The browser wars also take an interesting turn. I mean. The old Edge never had a chance against Chrome. Edge had a was very drift. The code name Spartan, but it never really got anywhere. But in 2019, 
Microsoft threw in the towel building their own engine. They had been working with Chrome all along. You know, the Chrome team and the, and the IE team were kind of on the same side in the W3C for advancing specifications. They largely battled Apple more than they battled each other. And so the idea that Microsoft would simply say, hey, why don't we just include Chromium in a new Edge browser? Not a bad idea. And an interesting form of competition. You know, we're still learning to live in this world where tech giants are part of the open source community. And sometimes, like with Kubernetes, and now with Chromium, you've seen coalescence around a particular library. I don't know how this plays out, ultimately. Uh, I think it makes Edge better. It certainly makes Chromium better. But it starts to poke at the different business models. So it's going to be interesting to see. This is more politically important, perhaps, than we necessarily understand. It's certainly something I, I pay close attention to. And just this past fall during the pandemic, we got .NET Core 5, or now .NET 5. And so it's a recognition that they're, they're pushing towards the unification of the, uh, the frameworks. That it's, we were already at a time where the standard framework is not getting some of the new features that are showing up in the, the new framework that uh, some of the new features in C Sharp are not going to be there and it may never be there. But also Microsoft's recognizing that maintaining these multiple versions of .NET is bad for everybody. And so can they get to a point where there's one .NET again that everybody can run well? So it doesn't matter whether you care about open source or cross-platform or any of those things. Can you move to .NET 5 too? Can you get all of the things you need? And not everything's making it. I mean, we knew WinForms wasn't going to make it, but it's also interesting to see that, that WCF as it isn't making it across either. Although, again, there's there are other solutions. GRPC has is, is gotten an interesting place. I think Mark Rendell's at this event as well, and he's working on tooling around that to help people migrate from WCF. So, you know, WCF's pretty long in the tooth, and it's not the end of the world that it may not be coming on. There's other ways to, to work with it. Uh, so it's interesting that we're trying to get that place. And I think they intended for .NET 5 to be the version that brought everyone together, the one to rule them all. But now I think they're thinking more like .NET 6. It's, it's hard. There's a lot to do. But open source, without a doubt, has come to Microsoft. And so it does beg the question, you know, what comes next? Because we are seeing new problems. Uh, we are seeing new moments where it could even be that open source, this battle between these tech giants, this sort of aggressiveness in open source, like you're, you're wrapping yourself in an open source banner to be competitive, not necessarily uh, functional within the community. And certainly there's been shows we've done on the rocks recently, this past year, talking about how, you know, if Microsoft comes a call and you know, you're somebody who's built a cool library, cool set of tools that work with .NET, and you're one person, and suddenly that sort of shows up on Microsoft's radar. Sure, you might get some contributions from Microsoft, but those are full-time employees, like they're gonna do a lot. And if you're, you know, the regular mortal human working on a hobby project part-time, you, you can't keep up with that. And you've seen some cases where then they go off and make their own thing because they can't, do what they need to with your thing. Uh, I don't know, again, the answers to that, but there are part of what's coming next is this reckoning of how the open source community works together. Both large companies with full-time employees working open source projects and the hobby and part-time projects. It's not an easy balance there. There's still more to come. But open source is here and it's not going anywhere. And it's fundamental to, to the way that Microsoft builds an awful lot of things. And I, for one, am excited by it. And uh, I hope you are too. Thanks so much for coming out to this, this virtual conference and being part of this session. I'll be around for a while to answer some questions and have a great, great rest of the conference. Thank you.